Today, I will tell you about some of the greatest scientists in the history of multiple sclerosis research. We will start with Jean-Martin Charcot, the man who named multiple sclerosis, and we will work our way all the way up to modern scientists who are still active and productive today, advancing our understanding of the disease. Let's have some fun. I'm Brandon Beaver. I make videos about MS every Wednesday, so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. It all starts with John Martin Charcot. Although multiple sclerosis had been previously described clinically, he was the first to actually see the pathological substrate of disability in multiple sclerosis. In 1868, he examined the brain of a female patient who had tremor, slurred speech, and abnormal eye movements and found multiple plaques. And he is the first to name the syndrome as multiple sclerosis. And he described many of its clinical sequelae and the variability of the disease, even though it was very poorly understood at that time. He also had a lot of other contributions to the field of neurology in general. He's the first to describe so-called Charcot's, Charcot's joint, which is arthritis, which occurs with chronic injury due to lack of proprioception or the feeling of where your joints are in space. People with various different forms of nerve damage, particularly peripheral neuropathy, can get arthritis over time. And he actually also described Charcot-Marie tooth disease, which is a hereditary form of peripheral neuropathy. And he also studied Parkinson's disease, hypnosis, and what is known as conversion disorder. Conversion disorder is basically psychosomatic illness, and it was previously thought to be a female-only illness. And of course, this is not true, and he was the first to describe conversion disorder in men. He's also a pioneer of the systematic neurological examination, examining patients in a very formal way and documenting it so that others could understand the findings. And as an interesting tidbit, Sigmund Freud, who you may not know is actually a neurologist, even though he's the father of psychology, was one of his students. Moving forward somewhat is Thomas Rivers, who is one of the first to understand that multiple sclerosis has to do with an abnormal immune system. The reason he hypothesized this is because he observed cases of a paralysis occurring after his patients received the rabies vaccine at the time. And he was able to demonstrate in animal models that the immune system can attack myelin, the fatty sheath of the nerve fibers, in certain types of experimental conditions that are artificially created. And he actually developed an experimental protocol known as experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, EAE. And this rat model of MS is still used today in basic science and clinical research. Interestingly, he had a neuromuscular disease himself of unknown cause and actually had to withdraw from Johns Hopkins Medical School, but he later returned. He's actually more well known for his research in infectious disease, such as polio and rickettsia. And this is a slide of demyelination in a racist macaque. So he was the one of the first to demonstrate demyelinating disease in animal models. This is Elvin Kabat, who is the father of modern immunohistochemistry. Immunohistochemistry is measuring very specific antibody binding to a specific target or antigen, which allows us to both observe and quantify the presence of the antigen or antibody. He also is the first to describe the structure of antibodies, discovering that they are gamma globulin proteins. He also is the first to find abnormal antibodies in the spinal fluid of people with MS, showing the importance of the immune system in MS. These antibodies are now known as oligoclonal bands or several bands as they appear on an electrophoretic gel. He, in other research, he also described the blood group antigens, the A, B, and O blood group antigens that we recognize as blood types today. He also did a lot of research on the genetic basis of antibody specificity. How is it that we're able to generate millions of different antibodies responding to millions of potential antigens and selecting for the ones that are good and eliminating the ones that are bad? This is a very complicated subject, obviously beyond the scope of this presentation. It's fascinating, and he was the first to describe it. Interestingly, he's also the father of a much more famous Kabat-Zinn, who is John Kabat-Zinn, 
who is the father of mindfulness meditation in the modern form. And he's the person quoted as saying, you can't avoid the waves, but you can learn to surf. This is Ian McDonald, a dashing and charismatic man, as he was described. And he created the first formal diagnostic criteria for MS incorporating MRI scans. Previously, Hoser's criteria did not incorporate MRI. So this was considered a modern advancement on diagnosing MS. And his name is still used in the diagnostic criteria to this day. He also showed that demyelination causes a change in the electrical transmission of coded messages through nerve axons, explaining the physiologic basis of multiple sclerosis symptoms. He also developed the test visual evoke potentials. This is a, an electrophysiologic test where you are shown a sort of checkerboard pattern, and we record how, that, how long it takes that information to go from your eye to your occipital lobe. We don't use it as much today, but it was used for the diagnosis of MS for many years. He also described both demyelination and remyelination in the central nervous system. In other words, was essentially the first to describe myelin repair in the nervous system. This is Claudia Lucinetti, a legendary neuropathology researcher. She's most well known for describing four pathological subtypes of MS. She did a very excellent study where she looked at the brain tissue of people who had died of MS or people who had biopsies of brain lesions who were later recognized to have MS. And she described that the lesions tended to appear in four different patterns. And I'll show you those patterns on the next slide. She also identified that MS is not just a white matter disease. The demyelination also occurs in the cortex or the gray matter. And she also did excellent research on a related disease that we now know as neuromyelitis optica, previously thought to be a subtype of MS. And she found vasculocentric immune complex deposition and was able to hypothesize that an autoimmune disease targeting a perivascular antigen was the cause of NMO. This was later proved to be true, and the antibody, or excuse me, the antigen in many cases is what we now know as aquaporin-4, and the antibody, anti-aquaporin-4, is seen in about 70% of people with that disease. She also did a lot of excellent research on ADEM, uh, um, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, which is a monophasic autoimmune disease of the nervous system. And these are the four subtypes she discovered. Type 1 is cell predominant. In other words, we see lymphocytes, neutrophils, macrophages, and other cells, autoimmune cells in the nervous system. Type 2, we see both cells and also antibodies and complement proteins that are part of the immune system. In type 3, she found both inflammation and also injury to the oligodendrocytes, the cells that make myelin. And in type 4, which is very rare, only occurring in about 1% of cases, you see primary oligodendrocyte injury with no major inflammation. And this is thought to be possibly a separate disease distinct from multiple sclerosis. Next is Omar Khan, who unfortunately died young relatively recently. He was an excellent clinical researcher who was involved in numerous famous clinical trials. One is the long-term rituximab safety trial. Another is OPERA, which is a randomized trial of Ocrevus versus Rebif. Another is CARE MS2, which is one of the Lemtrada trials. Another is three times a week Latirimer or three times a week Copaxone, which is now used today. He also studied the mechanisms of tissue injury, not just in MS, but also in Parkinson's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, and Alzheimer's disease. And he has a lot of publications on conventional and multimodal MRI in multiple sclerosis. And he also founded the African American Initiative in Multiple Sclerosis to look to see if African Americans have unique clinical features of the disease or if they respond differently to different treatments. Next is Ellen Mowry, who's still very active in epidemiologic research. And she just has such a passion for the field and is so pragmatic, really questioning the things that we assume to be true. And she did studies on the correlation between vitamin D and MS, and she did the high versus low dose vitamin D trial. She's also done some excellent research on potential benefits of intermittent fasting and calorie restriction in multiple sclerosis. And she's the author of a lot of review articles and commentaries about MS on topics such as vitamin D, nutritional supplements, metapoietic stem cell transplant. And she's the principal investigated of an ongoing PCORI funded 
pragmatic clinical study to see if we should adopt an induction therapy approach versus an escalation therapy approach. Induction therapy is essentially treating our patients with the strongest agent as early as possible. And escalation therapy is using a more uh, uh, conservative approach, using a potentially less effective but safer treatment and escalating to a more effective treatment only if necessary. And here is her data on calorie restriction showing that patients on calorie restriction with MS compared to controls seem to have better emotional well-being and there are other data points from the study, which I won't show here. This is Katerina Akasaglu. She had a great publication where she discovered the importance of fibrin and microglia in neurodegeneration and central nervous system repair in MS. And in addition to a bunch of excellent basic science studies, she had an excellent publication where she developed a fibrin targeting antibody and she used it in immunotherapy in a mouse model of MS, the experimental autoimmune encephalitis model that I mentioned earlier. And I'll show the results of that trial on the next slide. And because of that publication, she actually won a major MS research prize called the Brancic Prize for Innovation in MS Research. And this was in 2018. And a lot of her work is relevant to other neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. So this is her study on the antibody against fibrin. And you can see in red, the mice who were given this antibody did much better. They had a much better lower clinical score compared to controls. This is Annetta Langergould. Now I have to admit, this is a very biased selection. She is my former fellowship mentor, but she's done just incredible work. And I have to mention her here. She was the first to discover that exclusive breastfeeding in other words, breastfeeding the infant only with breast milk, not using formula at all, is associated with a lower risk of postpartum relapses. In other words, relapses which occur after delivery of the baby. Naturally, with MS, there's an increased risk of relapse shortly after delivery, but exclusive breastfeeding appears to decrease that risk. I'll show some of the data on the next slide. In 2005, the drug Tysavri was reported to cause an infection by the JC virus called PML, or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. There were two cases reported of PML prior to Tysavri being withdrawn from the market. She was the authors of one of those two cases. She also did some excellent epidemiologic research linking childhood obesity to the risk of pediatric multiple sclerosis, identifying a very important modifiable risk factor for MS. She also did a great study called the MS Sunshine Study, and I'll show you some of the data of that study, showing that the link between MS and sunlight is actually much more convincing than the link between vitamin D and MS. Also, it was previously believed that MS was a European disease occurring mostly in white people. But in Southern California Kaiser patients, she found that African-Americans, Hispanics, and Caucasians all have a roughly equal risk of the disease, and multiple other people have reported similar findings. This is the data from her postpartum relapses study, and if you look at the left column, you'll see the patients who are breastfed exclusively, excuse me, who did breastfeed their infants exclusively, and on the right are those who did not breastfeed or only breastfed partially and you can see a massive difference in the risk of postpartum relapses. This is the data from the MS Sunshine study, and you can see that sun exposure seems to be linked with MS risk in all ethnicities, but vitamin D level is only really linked to MS risk in Europeans, and that seems to be confounded by, vitamin, by sunlight exposure, showing that perhaps we shouldn't be telling our patients to take vitamin D, but telling them to go out in the sun instead, or perhaps both, which is what I do. So that's all I have for you today. And one thing I wanna mention is that when I did the research on all of these great researchers, these legendary multiple sclerosis researchers, I really appreciate how many people I was unable to mention just due to time constraints and how we like to tell the story of science as though there are few great men and women who sort of lead the way and we all follow and we all admire them. 
But the reality is a lot of the great innovations at MS have been the work of many, many people, each building on their own research, many people making small contributions. And there are a lot of other people I could have mentioned, just to give a few examples. Stephen Hauser did a, an excellent uh, genome-wide association study describing the genetics of multiple sclerosis and discovering pre may, many genes previously unknown to be associated with MS. Also, I could have mentioned uh, some other researchers who worked with Ellen Mowry doing similar epidemiologic research, and so, uh, such as Dr. Wabant at UCSF, for example, and many others. Uh, so I do want to give credit to all of the researchers at MS and everyone grinding, doing those EAE experiment, experiments and sitting over an Excel spreadsheet and really getting us that epidemiologic data. It takes so much work. I really appreciate it. And so I give all of you infinite respect. And it's great to be a young doctor in this field because I know I'll see great things and great innovations and great new people in the decades to come.